On behalf of the Center for Social and Environmental Justice, I'd like to welcome you to today's event on the environmental impacts of fossil fuels. And I'd like to especially thank you for sticking around in the midst of um, a snowstorm today, So, um, which is complicating today's events just a little bit. Um, so today's event is sponsored by the Center for Social and Environmental Justice at WSU Vancouver, which since its inception in 2002 has worked to catalyze collaborations between WSU faculty, students, and community partners to foster rigorous analysis of social, economic, racial, and environmental justice issues and promote human rights and conflict resolution at the local, national, and global levels through interdisciplinary community-based research, interdisciplinary curricular innovations, conferences, workshops, and public events and media projects. I hope you'll join us also for our next event on Thursday, February 20th, um, which will be a screening and discussion of the film Antonia, a Chicana story, directed by Luz Maria Gordillo, Associate Professor of Critical Culture, Gender, and Race Studies at WSU Vancouver. Um, and her co-director is Juan Javier Pescador. So Professor Gordillo will be on hand for a Q&A following the film on February 20th. Um, flyers with information on additional colloquium events can be found at the tables uh, coming into the auditorium if you'd like to pick one up on the way out. And I did have a request from a student who has a petition regarding the fossil fuel export depots and he will be, I think, somewhere in the back of the room um, with that petition, so um, you will presumably see him floating around. Um, so today's uh, event includes um, two lectures, and originally we were scheduled to begin with Eric DeFoss from the Sightline Institute speaking on climate impacts of fossil fuel exports in the Pacific Northwest. Unfortunately, um, due to the snowstorm, he is you know, somewhat slower um, making it down I-5. He um, will be here, but in light of that development, um, we've decided to flip the order of today's events and we'll, beginning, uh, we'll be beginning with Professor Ian Urquhart from um, the University of Alberta, and uh, my colleague, Professor Paul Fears, will be introducing him today. Thank you. I want to welcome Ian Urquhart here. Uh, thank him for coming. Um, uh, Ian is a, an award-winning teacher, uh, 30 years at the University of Alberta. 30, about that? No, no. Not quite. Like, like Since the late 80s. <laughs> Since the late 80s. Um, uh, he is a uh, professor of political science and has been teaching people about Canadian politics for a long time. Uh, uh, his, uh, including teaching people in the United States, he was a uh, Fulbright, Fulbright professor at Portland State University, uh, visiting research chair um, in 2007. Uh, his primary research interests are on the politics of resource ex exploitation in the Rocky Mountain West. Um, he's the editor of Assault on the Rockies. Environmental Controversies in Alberta, and he's the co-author of The Last Great Forest, Japanese Multinationals and Alberta's Northern Forest. Um, also uh, uh, politically active, um, including in, in 2012, uh, a run for Alberta's Senate as an independent, gaining more than 100,000 votes for the, uh, the next Alberta policy platform. Um, and has been uh, a long time in, in, in different ways associated with the uh, Alberta Wilderness Association. Um, I, I know we have probably some different populations based on which classes thought which talk was going to be when, but uh, I want to uh, welcome all of you here and also give a shout out to those of you who are studying climate change politics and policy with me. Thank you for coming. I see several of you here. Um, and stick around for the next talk if you can. But. Um, uh, I really want to thank Ian for coming. This is a, a really timely subject for us here in the Pacific Northwest, as, as well as a great topic for us academically as we think about some of these issues uh, in our research and in our teaching and in our, in our studies. So thank you, guys. Any Canadians here? Any Canadians? I'm not responsible for what's outside. <laughs> here at Portland State in 2007, we had a two-day snow closure there, so my luck just seems to be boundless when it comes to delivering climate weather to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, thanks to Paul. I'd like to thank Paul for the invitation uh, to be here uh, this afternoon, as well as uh, Lauren Mercier from History, who I met uh, when she was up in Edmonton at the University of Alberta as a Fulbright, uh, as a Fulbright professor. 
uh, and also to Desiree and Hollikers for the for the at the center for economic uh, for social and environmental justice for the opportunity to be here uh, this afternoon. What I'd like to do is try to talk for no more than say 45 minutes about uh, the tar sands. Uh, so there'll be lots of time uh, at the end, I hope, uh, for questions. And if I don't address the issue that uh, you're interested in, or the particular dimension of, of resource development and environment you're particularly interested in, uh, don't hesitate to ask uh, about whatever's on your mind. And if I can give you an honest answer about it, I will. If I can, I will flaunt my ignorance. And, uh, and that will be that. So, where, if anywhere, are these tar sands going to, um, going to end up? What I want to do today is really try to address three issues. I'm not sure how many of you are really that familiar with what's taking place in northeastern Alberta, uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, western provinces, and the northeastern part of Alberta. I'm not sure how many of you are aware with what's going on. Uh, with respect to fossil fuel development in, in Alberta. Uh, so I want to spend some time, maybe for some it will be too much time, uh, underlining and punctuating just the gigantic scale of tar sands development in northeastern Alberta. So I'll spend some time doing that this afternoon. <clears throat> I'd also like to look at factors that uh, people talk about uh, as being uh, responsible for the, for the scale of the exploitation of the oil sands that's taking place up there. Uh, and then I also want to spend some time uh, looking at the intensity and the internationalization of the opposition to what's taking place in the tar sands. And by internationalization, I, I mean primarily the Americanization of the opposition. There is significant opposition in the European Union to what's taking place in Alberta. Uh, the Europeans have uh, uh, passed fuel directives, for example, that target heavy GHG, greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuels like what's in the tar sands. Uh, but I'm going to focus mainly on the, uh, on, on the American side of the story. And for political science students, if, if there are any of you here, what that part of the talk is going to try to stress is how institutions matter how the structure of regulatory processes and the structure of approval processes for projects like Keystone are crucial in terms of shaping the way in which the opposition to this particular, to this particular type of development has, has developed. So this is the prize. This is what, this is what the prize looks like in northeastern Alberta. Uh, the crumbly sort of asphalt-like substance in the gloves on the, on the left-hand screen, that's the prize. Around this time of year when, when it's three degrees Fahrenheit as it is in Edmonton today, it probably looks more like that block on the, uh, on the right side, on the right, on, in the right-hand photograph. Uh, and down below you see uh, what are natural uh, bitumen seeps where bitumen oozes naturally out of the ground. This is, I presume, along a riverbank along the Athabasca River, uh, a, very major, a very major river in Alberta. Uh, this is a naturally occurring bitumen seep that seeps, into, seeps out of the ground, and in this case, into the, into the, Athabasca, into the Athabasca River. It's, um, in terms of what is it, uh, 75 to 80 percent of what you find in the oil sands is inorganic material. No, organ no, no organic material at all, and 80%, and excuse me, 90% of that is sand, hence sands. Tar sands, oil sands, depends what you want to call it. Um, boosters like to call it oil sands, critics like to call it tar sands. Uh, I use both interchangeably, and uh, here, for example, the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey still talks about tar sands here in, uh, here in the United States. So 90% of it is sand, 3 to 5% is water, and then the remainder is uh, the 10 to 12% that's left is the bitumen. Um, and to give some idea about how much, you know, you want to get, how many barrels of oil do you think you get out of what's in that fellow's, presumed fellow? 
hand on the left hand side of the left hand side of the screen uh, a draw uh, because it to, to make uh, a cubic meter of synthetic crude oil uh, you need which is just over six barrels of, of, uh, of oil to create that six, over six barrels of oil you need 11 tons of bituminous sands bituminous sands in order to produce those six barrels of oil so you essentially need two tons of sand to produce one barrel of synthetic of synthetic crude oil. But with respect to what's taking place in Alberta, this is what this is what it's about. Now, most I just most of the, the, the extraction that I'm going to focus on, uh, because of its obvious environmental impact, is surface mining, uh, and that right now is what mostly is taking place in northeastern Alberta. Huge open pit mines that are mining this stuff. Uh, the future, though, is going to be one that, on the on the surface, looks more benign. Uh, it's called in situ, meaning in place. And what it essentially refers to is when the bitumen, when the tar sands, when the oil sands is too deep in the ground to mine economically, what they've devised are systems that will inject steam, which is the most common, uh, the most common substance, inject steam into the bitumen reserve to make it flow. As you can imagine, this stuff doesn't flow through pipelines particularly well. So what you use is steam to heat up the bitumen, to let it drip down and flow into pipes that then suck it out of the ground. Now, petroleum companies in Canada have devised a, a host of uh, very pleasant looking at advertisements about uh, in situ oil sands production, because the surface impact doesn't look particularly, particularly harmful. But there are incidents now where people are wondering about just what's happening to groundwater underneath, uh, underneath the surface, and also if the earth itself isn't being shifted and transformed by this injection of steam into the ground. But I'm going to essentially focus on focus on uh, the mining the mining aspect of it. <clears throat> a couple of points about the economic magnitude of what's going, uh, uh, of what's taking, of what's taking place in northeastern, in northeastern Alberta. Back in the early 19, between 1993 and 1995, a, a task force of government and industry in Alberta, mainly composed of industry officials from the petroleum sector got together to think about how they could develop, how they could exploit the oil sands in Alberta. What did they need from the policy point of view in order to exploit the oil sands in northeastern Alberta? At the end of their report, what the, they have a series of recommendations, and this is what they hoped for. They hoped that they could secure 21 to $25 billion of investment in the oil sands, in the tar sands by 2020. That was, that was the goal. That was the investment goal. That was met easily and quickly. Um, by, by, 20, by 2004, we'd had, between 1996 and 2004, we'd already had $29 billion invested in the oil sands. And I don't care whether they're Canadian dollars or American dollars. It's a hell of a lot of money going into, going into the oil sands. So by 2004, we had that amount already invested in, already poured into this type of development. Um, the forecast, or excuse me, not the, not the forecast, the estimate of how much has been spent this century between 2001 and 2012 is $160 billion have been poured into these, have been poured into these projects. And looking ahead, what's, what's coming up in the next decade or so? Uh, another $207 billion is what they're forecasting to be invested in this, in this particular type of, uh, type of petroleum extraction. You can also look at the economic magnitude of it through production. What's happened with respect to production? And this is obviously relevant to those of you who are concerned uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about climate change. The production hope in 1996 was to triple production by 2020 through quote-unquote staged expansions. 
And the reason I've highlighted that phrase is that when you look at the task force report that, that came out in 1995-1996, one of the things that I think is striking about the report is its rationality. It's, it's just so rational and logical about how everything is going to happen up there. It's going to be one step after another, a nice, straightforward progression. Nothing can possibly go wrong with respect to what will take place up there. So I, I've highlighted it here because there was, this, there, there was, there was certainly this, this, um, uh, this over, overarching belief in the rationality of this, of, this, uh, of, the, of this process. And I think it's been anything but. I think the expansion, the, the dramatic, the spectacular expansion has been anything but rational. So again, this was a target that was easily met and met a lot earlier than they had hoped for. You know, this is what they were hoping for back in 95, 96. It was delivered again by 2004. Looking back to 2012, we've seen a six-fold increase in barrels of oil coming out of the oil sands since 1995 from 274,000 barrels a day to 1.6 million barrels a day over that particular time. And the, the production forecast is, yeah, I think, even more staggering. Uh, 2020, now they're calling for 3.2 million barrels a day to come out of the ground. Uh, 2030, 5.2 million barrels a day. Uh, so, there are two ways I think you can look at the economic uh, magnitude of the, of the boom uh, through investment and production. And what we've seen, I think, is an investment and a production boom of truly biblical proportions. Um, gold rush imagery is popular in Alberta now to talk about uh, what's taking place in the oil sands. And I think it's very apropos. Uh, this is the Klondike of the 21st century for that part of, for the, for that part of Alberta. To look at the spatial magnitude of the tar sands. So down here, here we've got you know, little Alberta uh, down here. And the area enlarged here is what, you see, is, what you see, is what you see there. So we're looking essentially at the northern half, the northern half of Alberta. And what I've tried to highlight with the arrows is around those, uh, those, those are townships that are in the surface mineable area in northeastern, in northeastern Alberta. The, the picture at the beginning of the, of the presentation is of a typical surface oil sands mining operation. And so the surface mineable area there is over 1,800 square miles. So you could put 14 Portlands in the lease area that is scheduled to be mined in northeastern, in, in northeastern Alberta. And I think a crucial point to note here on, on these slides is on this particular graphic is the percent of the areas that are under lease. Okay. If you have a lease with someone, you have a contract with that individual. And this works both ways. The government of Alberta have leased these lands to petroleum companies not to sit on them, but to develop them and to exploit the resources that are found there. So with respect to the surface mineable area, it's not as if, oh, there are 1,800 square miles that haven't been leased out yet. Virtually the entire area has been leased out. Now, I think what's, what's, what's especially relevant about this is if you want to stop this sort of development, think about the sort of compensation that you may be required, that governments may, that Canadian governments may be required to pay in order to buy back leases from oil sands, from, from oil sands company. So I mean, I think you know, looking looking ahead at how does investment slow, how do you slow down investment? They have really set up this juggernaut to continue to roll long into the future. The surface mineable area is part of the. Is part of this larger Athabasca oil sands area, uh, and 76% of that large, you know, the largest beige, whatever color that is, territory, 76% of that is leased to oil companies at this at this particular time. There's another way of looking at it, 
And that's from the spatial magnitude, from a different way of thinking about spatial, a different <coughs> incorrect spelling of spatial. This is, a, this is from Google Earth and is taken at what is essentially the midpoint of a low Earth orbit between 200 kilometers above the surface of the Earth to 2,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Uh, so this photo comes from about 1189. There's, I hail from here, well, I don't hail from here, I live there. Uh, I live in Edmonton, Lake Athabasca and Great Slave Lake. And these are the Athabasca sand dunes. And this is the beginning of the tar sands development in, in, in Alberta. So people say, and they're telling me it's totally accurate. I mean, you can, you can, you can see these beasts from space. Um, another way of putting it might be uh, what George and Sandra saw when they were up uh, doing their thing on the uh, Hubble Space Telescope in the movie Gravity. Uh, before all, all hell broke loose up there, this is what they would have seen. Uh, as they as they flew over uh, northeastern northeastern Alberta, as Sandra plummets to Earth uh, in the movie, and since she's now just you know she's out of low Earth orbit now, she's wondering where the hell am I going to end up? Uh, if she if she was headed to the Royal Sands and looked out the capsule window, this is what she would see was about where she was where she was going to land. Uh, so you see again, the blue arrow identifies where the uh, tar sands operations are north of Fort McMurray. And just before, <clears throat> just before she returns to Earth, this is what she would see from 19 miles away. It's quite a distance, I think. I mean, 19 miles isn't it's, you know, it's quite quite a distance away. This is what you see of the first two oil sands projects. Uh, Suncor, which back in the day was called Great Canadian Oil Sands, started by uh, J. Howard Pugh of the Sun Oil Company here in the, here in the U.S. Uh, the Suncor was the, Suncor was the first oil sands <coughs> operation. Syncrude was the second in 1970. Started in 1978. The thing I the thing that I think is important for me about this particular um, Google graphic from 2007 is the wonderful quote unquote view you get of the tailings ponds. Um, this here, this is the Athabasca River running right between these two operations. Suncor's initial operations is here on Tar Island. It's, that is what it's really called. Um, Tar Island here, and that's the Syncrude operation over there. So in the Syncrude, in the Syncrude tailings ponds, which goes back to the original, the original design, uh, the black is hydrocarbons. The black is toxic tailings, toxic hydrocarbons that haven't been fully utilized in the recovery and the processing, for, uh, in the recovery in the recovery process and the processing of oil sands. And so what I, you know, what is, what is nice for my purposes about trying to illustrate the magnitude of what's going on is the picture it presents of what's taking place with respect to tailings. If you move the next slide, just moves this just north of St. Crude and Suncor, and these are the new operations. These are the new mines, and, and this is a dated, since this is from 2007, this is a dated, um, dated, photograph, dated image. Now the Canadian Natural Resources Project called Horizon is up and running. Um, but what I wanted to, there, there are two things I wanted to use this particular image to point out. Uh, before you go in, you get, you, before you mine, you clear every, you clear cut everything that's on the land. So all the, so the forest ghettos, and that's what you see in the, in the northwest corner of, the, uh, of, this, of this particular image. Um, the other thing that's important to note, like come back to later on when I talk about environment, is that large lake in the northeast corner is called McClellan Lake. And I should have thought to include some images of, of some closer images of what you see, if you like, sort of coming out of the lake there. It's a patterned fen. It's really quite a remarkable, it's one of the largest patterned fens in the world. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a plant uh, moss guy, okay? But if there are any plant moss guys or gals here, they really get off on things like patterned fens. I mean, these are remarkable, these are remarkable, intricate patterns. 
that are created on the land. And that's going to be mined in the future by Suncor in its Fort Hills and its Fort Hills project. Now, I talked a bit about greenhouse gases at the, towards the end. But, and, and I think for Americans, uh, the greenhouse gas dimension of what's going on is what the primary focus has been. If you look at what 350.org is about, you know, to, to, I, I would say for the most part, the concern and the focus is on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we, the, people love to quote James Hansen. Uh, Dr. Hansen's quote about Keystone XL being the fuse to the largest carbon bomb on the planet. Okay. So there, there, there is, I think, a, there, there's an overwhelming predisposition to think about this issue with respect to greenhouse gases, and so you should, and, and, so, and so we all should. But I want to focus here a little bit on a, on a part of the story that I don't think gets the attention it, it deserves, because see, these, these landscapes matter uh, not only to uh, local residents, but they should matter to all of us as well. I might not get off on patterned fens, but that doesn't mean they're not incredibly ecologically valuable and should be retained in one form, one form or another. So here we see, this is the Athabasca River, the boreal forest around. Boreal is essentially, to be, to be quite honest, the boreal in the summer, mm, it can be a bit of a nasty place. Lots of bugs. Uh, Biting bugs. I mean, I like bugs, but the ones that bite, I'm not too crazy. I'm not too crazy about. Um, the boreal essentially is a mixed uh, coniferous deciduous forest, uh, and the wetter in the wetter in, in wetter conditions, it's dominated by aspen or black spruce. Uh, in drier conditions, um, birch on the deciduous side, uh, white spruce, uh, and in very sandy locations, uh, jack. It's part of the Mackenzie River system, which flows north. Okay, it goes north into Lake Athabasca, and the Mackenzie flows out of Lake Athabasca to the Arctic. And here we see it again flowing north of, uh, north of the oil sands, headed towards uh, Lake Athabasca. So the first thing I want to talk about then are sort of impacts on water. And these impacts on water have important uh, ecosystem consequences, perhaps. Uh, and they also have important human health consequences, perhaps, for First Nations uh, people, Aboriginal peoples, Indians who live in northeastern, who live in northeastern Alberta, downstream from the oil sands operations. This is a picture of that same sinker tailings pond. Um, or again, from t around 2007, I had the opportunity to fly over the uh, fly over the oil sands on several several occasions. Um, black here in the same group pond equals um, equals hydrocarbons. Um, in 2009, tailings ponds covered uh, 50 square miles of uh, of northeastern of northeastern Alberta and contained. Um, it's a cubic meter. I have no idea. I mean, it's huge. Well, I don't know. Is it huge? I don't know. But it, it was, it, tailings ponds in 2009 contained uh, 720 million cubic meters of, of tailings. And so I think I was losing my mind at this time or indulging a real geeky part of my personality. But I thought, well, I wonder how many billion barrels of oil that would be. So that's what it, so the ponds contain sort of an oil equivalent. 4.529 billion barrels of tailings is what these ponds that cover 50 square miles um, contain. And so then I thought, well, if you're, uh, you know, if you're not, if, if you're a really big oil sands producing operation, how long would it take you to fill all the tailings ponds that have been created? I mean, you know, you're working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So the geek in me uh, pulled out the calculator and calculated that at, Sin at Suncor's um, annual rate of production of last year, 361,000 barrels a day, it would take them over 34 years to fill up what's already there in northeastern Alberta. It's a huge, it's a huge amount. And the tailings ponds are growing in magnitude. Our premier 
uh, had an op-ed piece in USA Today that was a, a PR score, Premier like State Governor, that was a, a public relations coup. Uh, she talked about how the tailings ponds are essentially under control, they're actually being reduced in size, only to have officials deny that within a week's time. Unfortunately, readers of USA Today don't get that second piece of information. They only got the first, they only got the first from the paper. So it's, so tailings ponds, so it's an important water issue, but only if they leak, I guess, or you know, or unless you're a duck that says, oh, that looks like a pretty nice place to land, uh, only never to rise out of it, over never to rise out of it again. So crucial questions here for the ecosystem and for human health are, do these ponds leak? If so, how much do they leak? What the photograph, what this photo shows you is the Suncor oil sands operation in the foreground. Uh, back by the sulfur piles at the, in, in the background, that's where the syncrude operation, that's where the syncrude operation is. And what you see, and down in the lower right-hand corner of the photograph, that's the Athabasca River. So Suncor, back in 1967, when they built their tailings pond, built it right on the shore of the Athabasca River. Uh, originally, the original design had uh, called for a 12 meter high dike. This is called the Tar Island Dike. Called for a 12 meter high dike. It's now over 300 feet high. They continually added to it over, over, over time. So the, the, the question here is one of, I mean, how do people answer the question? There's no doubt. There's recognition that tailings ponds leak. There's recognition that this particular pond leaks. Back in 1997, the Alberta government reported the following about, about this particular pond. Suncor estimated that Although approximately 1,600 cubic meters per day of fluid seeps from Pond 1 into the Athabasca River, its studies have shown that there is no measurable impact to the river from this seepage. So Suncor's answer was, yes, it does seep. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. We, we can't detect any measure, measurable impacts on the river. So taking that 1,600 cubic meters a day into something that may be more and more familiar. That's six million US gallons. Wouldn't be as much if it was Canadian gallons. But US gallons, that'd be over six million gallons a day, are leaking, seeping into the Athabasca River from this one of several particular, and this is the oldest tailings pond too. So, you know, it, it, uh, I think it's an important qualification in thinking about this. But what, a later study has shown, and it's been used by the environmental group, uh, Environmental Defense Canada, they've estimated that the leakage from pond number one, you know, you might say, well, it's an environmental group. What the hell do you expect them to say about it? But their conclusions are that the leakage from pond one has escalated dramatically over that period of time. Instead of about six million gallons a day, we're now looking at about 22 million gallons per day. Does it matter? I mean, should you be worried about it if you're downstream from this particular, from this particular tailings pond? Now, to a layperson like myself, it seems pretty clear to me that as far as rivers go, and sewers as well for that matter, uh, the Athabasca is a pretty big one. It's, pretty, it, it's, a, it's a pretty big river. Even today, literally today, when the river flows at its annual lowest, it's still flowing at about 200 cubic meters a second. So billions of liters are going down that river every day. What does it matter if you put 6 million or 21 million liters of wastewater into that particular, into that particular river? It'll just wash out, it'll dilute, everything will be fine. That's not how First Nations people downstream from this particular pond view it. One of the, 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 the fly-in doctor, it's a, it's a community that during the summer months you uh, fly into by, uh, by aircraft. 
spaceship be in? What the hell else would you fly in about? Um, you fly in to Fort Chip, and Dr. John O'Connor, who was the, the, the community's uh, physician, detected higher levels of particularly, um, why is it doing that stop? My computer's going crazy. Um, all right, what's the point, Ian? You're trying to say something here. Just get it out. That there was a particularly rare bile duct cancer that had a much far greater incidence among Fort Chippewan than its uh, than statistics would suggest would be normal. So he sounded the alarm about this. First Nations people were very concerned about this particular this particular. Uh, this particular cancer and the number of immune diseases that were appearing in the community. This has been, when you see, um, what's that Canadian singer's name? Um, help me. Gordon Lightfoot. Bieber? Ah, Gordon Lightfoot. Nah, not Gordon. <laughs> Justin Young. Bieber. No, we're not talking pot smoking. <laughs> Neil Young. Neil Young, thank you. Thank you, my man. Yes, Neil Young. Uh, when Neil Young talks about what's taking place in northern Alberta, and he said, maybe it's not a, a bad down here, Ian, remember where you are. Um, uh, but he's received a lot of media attention in Canada for criticisms of the tar sands. And that criticism focuses largely on, uh, largely on the health impacts on First Nations, on First Nations communities. So, this is, and the scientists don't have an answer. We don't know what the impact is. The Alberta Cancer Board did a study of cancer rates in Fort Chippewa. They concluded no. The bile, this rare, exceedingly rare cancer is not out of whack. But you have lots of other cancers here, and they look a lot higher than they should be. But is it being caused by what's being put in the river? We don't have an answer. But what do you do when you don't have an answer? Do you find out the answer to the question before you proceed with development, or you develop first and find out later? And the path that's been taken in Alberta is the latter one. Develop first, more, more projects, and we'll do some studies on human health and see what the, and see what the consequences might be. So what about the land? So I want, to focus on, I want to focus on the land here. And this is that pattern Finn I was talking about, McClellan Lake, that some scientists regard as being a potential World Heritage Site for its size and its, int and its, and its intricacy. This is a picture that uh, I wish I had taken it, um, that World Wildlife Fund did when they were flying over this particular area. Uh, and this is, this is the part of the fin that uh, Suncor and uh, its partners plan to, plan, plan to mine. So you know, as that first slide indicated, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the environmental impacts are far from benign for this area. If this is what the pattern fin looks like now, this is probably what it'll look like once mining, once mining starts to uh, take, pl take place. There. This is essentially what's planned for that fan, for that wetland complex, for the boreal forest in general in northern, in, in northern Alberta. Now down in the foreground you see a shovel, that's the orangey thing, and beside it, it's hard to make out, is a truck. Um, and I wanted to give you, again, since I'm into gigantic in this presentation, I wanted to give you some sort of aspect, uh, some sort of idea about how gigantic those trucks are. When you take the land tour, they love to joke about the fact, or at least the person that uh, uh, gave me the tour when, when I was up there, love to joke about the fact that one time they tell a story about how somebody parked their pickup truck behind one of these Caterpillar 7, 797Bs. Any monster truck enthusiast here, you would love to get your hands on one of those. Um, the, I still think it's the largest truck in the world. Um, carries a 400 ton payload, in other words, drop a 747 in the back end of it, and that's the payload that this, that this little puppy uh, takes as it rambles around uh, mining pits in northern Alberta. Anyways, the story was that, that they loved to tell was um, the, the fact that you know, some, somebody parked his pickup truck behind one of these, 
and went to do whatever, left the truck. Um, the operator of the uh, 797B uh, backed up over the truck and didn't feel it, didn't even realize that he had smushed it into whatever it was. This is what a mining operation looks like. You don't get to see this when you go on the land tours. You get to see this only if you fly over the operations. So each of these, each of these oil sands uh, trucks will carry a 400 ton payload when it's loaded. Um, they are able to be loaded by the truck and shovel by the shovel operations in less than, in less than three minutes. This next photo sort of reminded me when I took it, when I flew over the site, of what ants at a picnic. You know, like when you, you drop that real sweet stuff out on the, out, out on, on, on your, what do you call those things you have picnics on when you're sitting on the ground? <coughs> Anyways, um, and uh, then all the ants come to, uh, you know, to, to sample your wares. Uh, this is very much what it looks like when you fly over a typical mining, a typical mining operation in Northern Alberta. Shovels dot the landscape, and running between them and then off to the processing plants are trucks, are these huge 797Bs. Okay. I'm clearly a negative thinker. I mean, uh, bemoaning the damage that's done to the landscape as a consequence of this, but come on, we, we fix it. You know, we reclaim it. Uh, and the, the photos of the Tar Island Dyke and the pond that I showed you were from 2007. And you can see from this series of, of, of photographs that the pond has been reclaimed. I mean, they are now, they, they, now things grow on top of that uh, as, a, as, a, as a consequence. Seepage rates from Pond 1 will probably decline over time as a consequence of certain measures that they're, that they're taking. So there is the whole business of a reclamation. But this is what it looks like now. Um, you see different categories of land. This figures from the Alberta government. With respect to the land status of the lands that are affected by oil, oil sands mining as of the end of 2012. Okay. So cleared in, I, like, I particularly like the phrase disturbed. You know, so these lands are just being disturbed. Okay, if you say so. Uh, blue is disturbed. I guess harsh pink is not disturbed. I mean, clearing land is not disturbing, apparently, uh, in Alberta. And then the five other categories above that are in are having to do with reclamation. They're ready to go. Soils have been placed. They're temporarily reclaimed. They're permanently reclaimed. And then they're certified reclaimed. They get the government stamp of approval that yes, you have established a workable ecosystem back on this particular piece of land. And we give you, here is your certificate that we attest to that. It's really hard to see that little blue line. I don't know if anyone, I don't even know if you can see it. It's at the very, very top of the, of, of, of the graphic. And I thought it justified very tiny print beside it to say just how much land in northern Alberta, lands affected by oil sands mining, have been certified reclaimed. A whopping 104 hectares of that 84,395 have been certified as reclaimed at this particular point in, particular point in time. Uh, that would be 0 0.001 with some other numbers after it percent of the land has been reclaimed at this time. So sure, I mean, there's the, you know, everyone will talk about land reclamation. But these operations have been going on now since the late 1960s and the mid-1970s. And this is the state we're at with respect to reclaiming those lands. Now, technology is wonderful. Um, and so you'll hear the arguments about how things will be better, Ian. Just be patient. You know, things will be better in the future when it comes to reclamation. I think the historical record is not a particularly uh, awe-inspiring one. Okay. All right. So, um, and I'm getting close to when I said I was going to end. So, I'm, uh, oh, well, it's a rambling professor. Um, if I want to look at explaining the boom about what it is that's, you know, why is this happening? Like, are Canadians just some sort of like malicious environmentally First Nations messing up kind of folks? 
who want to do this, who want to do this sort of stuff, the lab. Well, what ex what explains what what's taking place up there? I so for argument's sake, I said, well, there, there are three sorts of arguments you can think about. I mean, we're mining this stuff because oil prices have gone through the roof, and now it's finally, finally, economic to mine this stuff. It wasn't economic before, but now with global oil prices the way they are. It makes sense. It makes economic sense to do that. That's one possible explanation. Technology is another one. The truck and shovel operations that you've seen. Reduced development costs. How important is that? And then there are politics. And not surprisingly, the political scientist wants to dwell more on politics than on anything else. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on the two, on, on, on the first two. Changes that were made with respect to taxation and royalty rates, regimes in, in Canada, that made it incredibly, in my view, made it incredibly lucrative to get into the oil sands mining business and the oil sands production business. And then the nature of political support, the nature of opposition tactics, I think were important too in explaining what happened. So how far does increases in global oil prices get you? I don't think it gets you very far at all. This is not, this is not a picture that suggests that when this National Oil Sands Task Force was meeting at this particular point in time, that they had any idea of what was going to happen here. And in fact, they didn't. You cannot, and I, I invite someone to prove me wrong on this, go into the business press in the mid-1990s and see what anyone in the business press was talking about with respect to oil prices in the year 2000 and after 2000. Nobody, nobody to my mind, my searches anyway, was talking about increased prices. The regime that was talked about, I mean, we, you have peaks, like here the first Gulf War, where prices shot up but then came down again. You have the collapse of the Asian financial crisis at this particular point in time. You have this drop here, which was 9-11. The picture over this period, period of time is one of stable oil prices. You can, and as I say, you cannot find experts, analysts, who thought that oil would be today, West Texas Intermediate would be trading at $97 a barrel, or wherever it is today. So for, for my way, my way of looking at this is, is no, this was not something, this hasn't happened because all of a sudden, it became profitable to do this. What I argue in the research I'm doing, and I don't have time to go into it today, is that it has been profitable all along. And companies have made good money, Suncor and Syncrude have made good money in the oil sands throughout this period. What governments did through tax changes and royalty changes was make it even more lucrative than it was, than it was, than it was previously. Technology is a big part of the explanation. There's no doubt. This is, these, are the, these are the relics. This is the way they used to do it. They used to set up this, this bucket wheel thing here. It's got some name like Bucky or something like that. I don't know. But anyways, so Bucky's sitting on the road now on the way up to the oil sands plant. And it used to drop its payload into these huge conveyor, mechanical conveyor things. Um, they broke down a lot. Um, they didn't cope particularly well with minus 40 Fahrenheit or centigrade in, in, the, Alberta, in the Alberta winter in that, in, in that part of the province. They were economically tremendously inefficient. The move to truck and shovel operations has been key to getting more of the product to the processing plant quicker. They can target which are the richer seams. They can balance it with, with less rich seams. They can come up with the bitumen mix that they want. And the shovels being mobile are a lot easier to move around. And the trucks are huge. And there are many of them. And so the technology has been a real boon to production. And it has lowered development costs significantly. On that point, What's worth noting is that, you know, a, a, a phrase from a company official who suggested that, you know, according to the normal range of, given the normal range of oil prices, our company, Suncor, can be profitable over the normal range of oil prices. 
the normal range that he was talking about was $20 to $30 a barrel. That's how significant the technology change was. It made them competitive at $20 to $30 a barrel of oil. They would make money at those prices. I want to focus on, 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 on politics, though. And what I want to suggest is that essentially what you had in Alberta, and you have now in Canada, is a rolling back of the state. The finance minister in Alberta in the 1930s liked to talk about Alberta needs to get out of the business of business. You know, just get them out of the way. I mean, just get out of the way of business. You know, with too many regulations. Get rid of them. Too many bureaucrats. Let's fire some. Let's give them, get them out of here. I don't care how you do. Well, yes. But get them out. You know, get, we're, 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 we're over government effectively. Comments about the ad hoc nature of the royalty regime. The task force that I alluded to earlier talked about um, this is an ad hoc regime. We have uncertainty. We have a problem with uncertainty. We need predictability. And government delivered it. But in delivering it, they also delivered lower royalty rates for oil sands, for oil sands companies. And finally, the opposition. To the extent there was opposition in Alberta, and Canada more generally, it was extremely tame. The official opposition parties in the provincial legislature supported what took place at the oil sands. There was no debate at the national level about whether this should go ahead. In fact, the governing party at the time, the Liberals, viewed promoting oil sands as a way of trying to increase their political capital and their political support in Alberta. On, environmental, on the environmental side, to the extent that they were able to participate in hearing processes, they were remarkably tame. The approach that environmentalists took in the 1990s and early 2000s was essentially an approach of give us the best available technologies. You're not doing enough to reduce, to mitigate what you're doing. So get better technologies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. No one, no one, until the latter half of the first decade of the century, no one said absolutely not to a project. It was always you know, ways of making it happen in the most environmentally benign, it's a terrible word to use, environmentally benign fashion. So use best available technologies. So, you know, current opposition, why is it so intense and why is it so international? You know, and it's a stupid question maybe, you know, duh, you know, I mean, climate change, right? Um, so this comes out of this, this statement comes out of the most recent. Can you have a final, final supplemental EIS in the State Department? I don't know if they can produce that or not. But here you have what ostensibly will be the final supplemental EIS that the State Department has prepared for the Keystone XL pipeline, for the northern part of the Keystone XL pipeline. There's no doubt oil sands crudes are generally more greenhouse gas intensive than other heavy crudes are. There's no doubt that they are roughly about 17% more greenhouse gas intensive over the life cycle than the average barrel of oil from produced in the US back in 2005. So are they worse for the climate than this reference point from 2005? Yes. Are they worse for the climate than comparable heavy crews like Venezuela, uh, Mexican mining crude? The answer is yes, but not by <coughs> as much as people might, as, as people might, uh, as people might not believe. This is from this statement is from the executive summary. If you go and look at the the, the, the appendix to to the report, one of the things that you find, one of the things that you read there, is that the gap isn't as great as perhaps people believe. If you're willing to consider things, so I'm putting on an industry hat, people might argue here, or the Canadian government hat. So um, the difference isn't as bad as environmentalists claim if you consider the amount, the gross amount of flaring of natural gas 
that takes place with, say, the production of Nigerian light oil. Nigerian light oil is less greenhouse gas intensive, but they don't measure or take into consideration the amount of natural gas that's flared in, order, in the production of that oil. Similarly with Venezuelan heavy crude. The flaring of natural gas that takes place in Venezuela is not part of the life cycle assessments that have been referred to by the, by the, by the State Department. I mean, why focus, on, why focus just on Keystone? to the exclusion of other sources of imported oil that have higher GHG emissions than the benchmark 2005. It's not as if Keystone and Alberta tar sands oil is, um, is let's see, how to phrase this right. It's not as if Mexican Mayan oil or Venezuelan crude is as benign, again, a terrible word to use, as benign as that 2005 reference barrel in the US, they're not. They're all more greenhouse gas intensive than that one is. So why not focus, why not focus on Kuwait on the prairie? Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this image. This is your country at night. Um, and what the hell has happened to Fargo, North Dakota? I mean, it has gone like totally crazy from the growth perspective, by the looks of it. Um, you know, what are all those lights doing in the middle of nowhere where there's grass and more grass? I and mean, you know, what, what, what's, what's happening out there? That's flaring. That's flaring from the Bakken oil shale operations that's taking place in North Dakota. That flaring is incorporated into life cycle assessments of how much greenhouse gas emissions come with the oil that's coming out of North Dakota. And you are going to benefit, if you're an oil consumer, you're going to benefit tremendously from what's happening in North Dakota right now. Ten years, or more than ten years ago now, 2002, the, um, the total oil production out of the state of North Dakota was 82,000 barrels a day. You know, not very much at all. July of last year, it was nearly 900,000 barrels a day. And it's all a result of exploiting the bathroom. So, I mean, some in Canada, I think, who are sort of boosters of Keystone, have some merit. I think there is some merit to their point when you say, why just Keystone? I mean, why aren't you concerned about what's taking place in the Bakken? Why aren't you concerned about Venezuelan crude coming into the Gulf? Why the focus on the tar sands? <clears throat> so I want to tr try to suggest that just a couple of reasons uh, why I think that the opposition has been so intense and been so uh, international. And, and one is simply, goes back to the previous slide about what's happened in Canada, the state's failure to regulate the state's failure to intervene at all just created this free-for-all, this free-for-all expansion with respect to what's taking place there. And that, that, you know, you would think, perhaps, that should be good for business, right? I mean, they can do essentially whatever they want. But if everyone in this room wants to build an oil sands project, where are you all going to get the labor to do that? You're going to start outbidding each other for labor. Where are you going to get all the steel you need? to do that. You're going to start raising the bids on producing inputs or on buying inputs for your operations. And this is essentially what's happened in Northern Alberta. And I think, and that actually the irony is, to my mind, that this free-for-all of investment and production, this spectacular, this frightening expansion, has actually produced <coughs> conditions that aren't necessarily healthy for new projects going ahead because it's become so damn expensive. It's become so damn expensive that the, you know, the per barrel cost of building these projects have increased dramatically. And I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think that by inflating project costs dramatically, it's certainly played into some corporate decisions that have invited opposition from here in the United States. Uh, the reference to all against the hall is a reference to a group that formed in Montana. They may have had some members in Idaho. Maybe they had members up here on the, on, on, towards the coast as well, I'm not sure. 
But they mobilized because Exxon Mobil's Canadian subsidiary, Imperial Oil, is building the Curl Project that's now underway. What Imperial did in order to cut costs was manufacture the modules for parts of the plant in South Korea, ship them across the Pacific, up the Columbia, up the Snake, to Lewiston, and then load them onto trucks to take them north to Canada. The people who think that Lolo Pass and that particular highway is a particularly scenic, wonderful place to be uh, took, object, took exception to this particular plan. What happens? Groups form in the United States, using the, use your court system to make Imperial change its plans. Uh, they had to use the interstate system in, 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 in instead with some, modi with some modifications. But my point here is that I, th I look at this, as a political scientist, I look at this as being an example where the state, by failing to intervene, actually creates conditions that are problematic for companies, that they're ostensibly trying to help, that they're ostensibly trying to get a benefit. It's contributed to corporate decision making that has invited, invited opposition. So that's one place I look. I look at the failure of government to regulate and to manage. This is the, this is the institutional part of the story, though, for me. And it's features of the Canadian and the American regulatory processes that institutions matter with respect to why this opposition has become so intense. You know, the US and Keystone. Do you know that the southern leg of Keystone has already got oil in it? I mean, the Keystone, Keystone pipeline is composed in your part of the country, in your, in your country, rather, is composed of two segments, a northern segment and a southern segment. The Gulf Coast project was commissioned last month, received regulatory approval, you know, a year, two years ago, I can't tell you exactly when, and is currently shipping 300,000 barrels of oil a day to the Gulf Coast. Later this year, it will be up to 500,000 barrels a day of oil to the Gulf Coast. It hasn't been the focus of opposition because there isn't a presidential permit involved. The, 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 the nature of the decision making, I think, has been crucial to the way in which Keystone opposition to, in the U.S. has crystallized and the focus that it's taken. So people concerned about the pipeline could go after Obama during the 2012 election, try to raise it as an issue, okay? try to encourage him not to grant his permit. Republicans could use it during the 2012 election to say, you know, we're in favor of jobs, those damn Democrats aren't in favor. So the particular feature of the regulatory process, I think, helps us explain the character of the opposition and where the opposition has been focused, has been focused. In Alberta, what's happening in Canada now is really disturbing from the public participation point of view in regulatory and environmental assessment processes. And I think that what's happening has led Canadian angos to essentially give up on domestic politics and create links with like-minded environmental groups in the US and elsewhere to try to use the American political system as a way of stopping what's going on in Canada, as a way of using American markets and American consumers as a way to stop what's happening in Canada. And what I mean here, when I talk about standing, I'm talking about you know, your ability to participate in a regulatory or an environmental assessment hearing. In Alberta, the law has been changed from directly affected. Okay, so first you have to prove you were directly affected. This wasn't easy. Alberta Wilderness Association knows that. It wasn't easy to say that you were directly affected if you didn't have a member who lived in the vicinity of a project. That's been tightened through legislation that's just been passed in Alberta last year. It's not only directly affected, but you have to show that you're adversely affected by what's taking place. They're making it more difficult for the public to participate in regulatory hearings in Alberta. That, I think, led back in 2005, 2006 to the first efforts by Canadian environmental groups to hook up with American groups to raise the issue of the tar sands here in the United States. It's a failure of the domestic process to deny, to deny that public participation. 
And Canada's Federal National Energy Board is doing the same thing. It's taken a page out of that book. The only thing I'll highlight here is that it's moved from the notion of, if I, if, I am, if I have an objection to a pipeline project in Canada, the old rule said that as long as I was an interested person, and by having an objection, I was an interested person, I could participate and raise those objections with the National Energy Board. Not anymore. The national legislation in Canada has been changed to I can no longer be that academic sitting in the ivory tower at University of Alberta raising an objection. Instead, I have to prove that I'm directly affected by it. Again, a test that is a much more stringent one and designed to limit public participation. As is always the case, I've gone on for longer than I promised, and much longer than I promised, and I, I, I apologize for that. Um, this is what the future looks like. You know, whether it's going to be in Alberta, it's, 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 is it going to be the it's going to be the foreground or the background? And I think that you know, post Keystone politics in the U.S. here uh, are going to be an important are going to be an important factor shaping uh, the future of the boreal in Alberta. So, thank you for your attention. against the uh, oil terminal they want to build at the port here uh, that would be bringing Bach and Shale crude oil, the type that's had uh, four explosions in the past six months. Right. The exploding trains you see on TV come from one place, Bach, and, and they're coming here. Can I ask your, can I ask your name? Dave Goldberg. So uh, Mr. Goldberg here has a, has a petition. You might want to go at the back because there's another well, yeah, question back there, Dave. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So please, you can talk with him if you'd like. Um, yes, I have a question. Uh, if the Keystone pipelines are not approved, what is the likelihood that Canada will build a pipeline through the Rockies so over the Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the Enbridge pipeline, I think the Northern Gateway faces years of legal, uh, legal trouble uh, because of First Nations objections. Um, so, but there is another proposal, the Trans Mountain proposal, Kinder Morgan, which I think has a greater like, it doesn't face the same sort of hurdles as the, as, uh, with respect to the First Nations traditional land use side. So, um, do I think they will find, uh, I can change the question, do I think they will yes. find other ways of getting that oil out? I think the answer is yes, they will try to. Even TransCanada has said, as I say, the southern leg of Keystone is there. Um, TransCanada has said that if the northern leg isn't a that they will look at what Dave was concerned about, um, rail transport from Alberta to Cushing, build a facility in Cushing to store the oil there, and then put it in the pipeline from Cushing to go down to the Gulf Coast. There's also another pipeline proposal in Canada. Enbridge wants to reverse one of their pipelines as they're taking oil from east to west. They want to reverse it to take um, oil sands crude to uh, the Montreal area in Quebec, to refineries there, and go out that way. So, I think that, that uh, they will certainly try to find ways of way, way, ways to do it. Um, I think of the two West Coast proposals, the, uh, the Kinder Morgan is the, uh, uh, is the one that if I was a betting person, I would say it's more likely to be approved and sooner than, and, than the end of the end of the end Where does Kinder Morgan come Pardon into? Is Kinder Morgan also comes into, <laughs> into British Columbia? Yeah, Kinder Morgan owns the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Okay. Um, I wonder if I could ask a question and, and bring up the reversal of pipelines and so on. Uh, uh, makes me think about it. I want to also get a sense of the folks here. Um, ten years ago, even eight years ago, we had proposals for liquefied natural gas terminals in Astoria and on the Vancouver side, um, pipelines. Uh, um, Trains, all of them were going into the United States. So you might remember that those liquefied natural gas terminal proposals were for liquefied natural gas import. 
Now, just 10 years later, these are all reversed. Everything's going in the other direction. Um, and I think this is something that also helps us think about the Balkans and the tar sands together. So what is, what is causing this, this sea change in, in uh, direction? The United States imports are actually dropping. Shale gas. Um, the, 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 the short answer is the uh, fracking, the hydraulic fracturing of coal, of, 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 of coal shale to produce natural, to produce natural gas from it. So you have this boom, and, and it's, it's essentially the gas side of what's taken place in the Bakken on the oil side of things. You essentially blast these coal seams with, uh, with uh, hydraulic liquids of one form or another, liberate, free the, uh, free the natural gas, and then so the Marsalis shale on the, on, on the east coast has been an important source of this, important developments in Texas that way. Um, I think it's, it's I think it's the International Energy Organization uh, agency, pardon me, that has now said that you know, you will be uh, you will be a uh, could be a net exporter of petroleum back by, by 2030 with these developments that have been taking place. Um, it's no one you know when I make my crack about the fact that people didn't predict what was oil prices going where they were. It's a fool's game, in my experience anyway, to try to make these predictions about what's going to happen 10 years from now. Nobody in North Dakota, I would venture, 10 years ago, thought that the Bakken would be producing what it's producing today. No one saw, no one saw that coming. Um, so, you know, I think what, you know, when you, when you look at this whole pipeline reversal uh, issue, um, it's just to increase U.S. production from unconventional sources. You know, the U.S., the lower 48 states, oil production peaked back in 1970-71. This is all production from new, unconventional sources of petroleum that, for the most part, are being produced as a result of fracture, uh, fracture of that particular process. Just as a follow-up to that, in Alberta politics, and, and among the elites, is, was there shock or concern at the decline in, in U.S. imports? Uh, the, you know, the U.S. is essentially becoming a barrier to export rather than a market. If, if, if uh, yes, there, there certainly has been. I mean, the, uh, the Alberta Premier has spent uh, um, several, uh, has spent taxpayers' dollars on several occasions journey to Washington to lobby, to lobby on behalf of Keystone. Um, the hope with a pipeline like Northern Gateway, and some of that, um, some of that crew that would go out uh, that way and also from Trans Mountain is Asia, is China, uh, and, and, and Asian markets. So, um, yeah, I, I, whether, you know, back then, Canada has been the most important foreign source of oil in the United States since 2001. And not many Canadians know that, even fewer Americans know that. Um, tend to think that Saudi Arabia is the most important source of, source of American control. American control. But in any event, um, the, 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 I think the search for other markets is, uh, is underway. Um, and we'll see, we'll see that, and we'll see, we'll see that case in Asia. Asia is the, sort of the, uh, uh, the biggest possibility in our respect. So um, I wanted Desiree's going to give us an update. I just on jump in really quick for a minute, and then we'll have more time for Q and A afterwards. But I just want to let you know that um, our speaker from the Sightline Institute has been stuck in scenic Ridgefield for about two hours now, and he's really not moving. So, um, uh, you know, we will be rescheduling that talk on campus. But I also want to just refer you to the Sightline's um, reports that are available online. Um, because, you know, the implications, the study that they've done has estimated that the climate impacts of burning the fossil fuels that will be um, transported through those proposed export depots in the Pacific Northwest, they're estimating the climate impacts of those fuels at seven times the climate impacts of the Keystone Pipeline, which, you know, as climate scientist uh, James Hansen has indicated, you know, might be game over for the planet if those uh, fossil fuels are consumed. So I feel like it's a, a really important uh, report for people to access and think about as these hearings and uh, you know available opportunities for weighing in with the governor continue in the Pacific Northwest. Um, 
So uh, we will be rescheduling that talk, and then I'd just like to re-surrender the floor, and we can continue this dialogue. Thank you. Um, if, I think before we maybe go, and if folks want to stick around and have a few more questions, I think we can do that. But let me just ask you to, to thank Ian for coming uh, quite a long way. Anyway, the, or 
North, North Dakota, I'm sorry, North Dakota. I'll get it. Anyway, um, Democratic Party politics in the upper Rockies are not going to be challenging extreme energy or construction. There's yeah. just no way for that. But, but when we think regionally, one of the things that's interesting to me is the, the Pacific Northwest itself as a pivotal, and here I'm speaking broadly about maybe we'll include British Columbia down to Northern California if we can at least, and maybe even into coastal Alaska, to think about energy export, um, equipment import with reference to the, the very big machines that you, that you spoke of, as a, as a key bottleneck that is dominated more by a regional politics. Um, Inslee in this state, uh, we all have various images of sort of Portland and how green that is. Uh, British Columbia with uh, the first serious carbon tax. Um, green member of parliament, green member of the state uh, assembly. Uh, what do you think about kind of this region as a political gateway for all of this energy? I think you have more, I mean, I think there's an important difference between American politics and Canadian politics, whether it's at the regional, you know, state, provincial level or the national level. Um, and that is, I know gridlock drives people crazy with respect to Congress, but there are so many more opportunities in American politics to get in somehow into the system and participate. You know, so the whole, we all against the whole people were able to use the courts effectively to do that. Um, there are more opportunities with respect to um, the regulatory processes and regulatory hearings in the U.S. and the, than, than in our than in our Canada. So I mean, so I think that'll play. I think that'll play out whether we're talking about regional or national. Um, and I do think that there is a there is a, a greater accessibility. Um, a higher level of transparency um, about American politics that you know makes the, the, the sort of uh, uh, that, that makes opposition you know, at the regional level an opposition that you might want to spend your time on because you think it's going to have real consequences at the end of the day that it will matter at the end of the day. I, I'm more skeptical about situations in places like Alberta and Canada than they generally. I would say no, um, and um, the, the liberals were important architects of what happened in Alberta in the, 19, in the 1990s and through the Cretchen and the, the Paul Martin um, administrations. Now we've got, you know, the official opposition for the time being nationally is the New Democrats, and they are certainly more willing to, in a sense, throw their party members in Alberta under the bus on climate change and oil sands issues. So they have spoke, so the New Democrats have been taking a much, much tougher line uh, on, uh, on the issue of the oil sands and developing them than we've seen from an opposition party in, you know, in, in, in Canada in the past. Um, yeah, so there has been, so liberals, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I think the jury's out on people like Justin Trudeau as the new leader of the party. But you know, this is sort of like one of the things that, just to digress for one second, I mean, I looked for, like when I grew up in Canada, intellectually, sort of theories of the state were sort of a big deal. Autonomy of the democratic state, rethinking sort of uh, state's role with capital. And you know, I looked for who were the usual suspects who, would, who, who you would find opposing 
projects. I mean, th when they would set the dynamic up between capital and labor, for example. Well, where was labor on this? They were with capital. I mean, they, 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 they wanted to have. Where's the opposition political parties? Well, they're with the government on this one. And so I think what's interesting about the future is that, you know, is whether the new style or a new focus in politics can force the state to change the sort of business as usual approach that I think they've taken with the US hands. Like, will the environmental opposition, you know, will that matter at the end of the day? In terms of what's taking place in places like in places like Alberta, uh, you know, and that's something we get to watch over the next, you know, over the next while. So I hope that answers that. Yes, sir. Um, first, is more of an observation. Last week, uh, we heard a presentation from Marcelo Diversity and Human Development about the impacts of the massive Belamonte Dam in Brazil, mm -hmm. and so I just want to point out that we're, you know, even though we've got, you know, some pretty catastrophic. Predictions about the impacts of burning the tar sands oil. Um, what we're not getting is any kind of aggregate um, portrait of what the implications are of, for example, the Belamonte Dam alongside the tar sands, alongside the Venezuela oil. And that seems like a critical omission. And I think, you know, to me, the significance of partly the um, site plan report lies in its, in its commitment to uh, portraying a kind of aggregate uh, portrait of the impacts of these collective projects. So that's, that's the observation part, but I, I guess I want to ask the question about the role of um, Idle No More and the concerns about First Nations people that have been a really important catalyst to the international, or at least you know, strongly uh, American opposition and even Canadian opposition, I think, mm -hmm. to the tar sands. And this yeah. question that you raised about you know, how, who has standing to claim that they're impacted by these projects in order to enter into this political process. So I wonder if you could speak sure. to that. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know more is a, is, is a, is a fascinating movement for, for several reasons. And one of them is, it's also an important challenge to the traditional leadership. I don't mean elders, I mean you traditional. You just make sure people who don't follow Native American politics know what oh, I don't know okay. more is I don't, I don't know more was a, um, uh, a Native protest movement that developed in Canada out of nowhere uh, regarding a hunger strike that a particular chief had uh, undertaken as part of an assertion of whites, I believe, I'm not 100% sure on that. And it became a sort of national, it became a sort of national protest, started popping up in different parts of Canada, taking issue not only with, my point was not only with the federal government, but also with their own leadership, uh, but also with their own elected, their selected chiefs uh, as well. Um, I think right now, the way the politics in Canada are, that uh, the Constitution of 1982 was added with the provisions on uh, Native rights that are found in Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. They provide the potentially most important lever to try to stop some of these developments. Right now, for example, there's a you know, really important case in, uh, in, in um, there are important cases in what will happen with respect to the Northern Gateway is that they will be cases about the failure of the Crown, the government, to fulfill its constitutional duty to consult and accommodate First Nations. So I think in terms of these sorts of projects, the First Nations legal strategies um, represent the most sort of the most sort of political or the most plausible way of dealing with it. One of the things though the, the um, one of the things in Canada that doesn't get spoken about a lot is um, so when you think First Nations in Canada, you think Neil Young sitting and beside Neil Young, Alan, Chief Alan Adam of the Athabasca First Athabasca Chippewa First Nation. Um, or you, you think about idle, you think about idle no more. What you don't think about and what you don't realize is the extent to which some of the First Nations in the oil sands area rely importantly on the oil sands for their own livelihoods. So there's this, there, you know, James Cameron, that was the other one, the other celebrity I wanted to mention, who came up there and took a tour and you know, 
let's stand in solidarity with First Nations people. Um, some First Nations people have been real boosters of what's going on in northern Alberta. Uh, i paraphrase a quote I have in some research I've been doing from Chief Jim Boucher of the Fort Mackay First Nation, which is situated right in the heart, the epicenter of what's going on for mining. Chief Boucher said, paraphrasing him, uh, as long as the future of oil is good, the future of Fort Mackay is good. Um, their group of companies is a group of companies that where the overwhelming proportion of their business is done with oil sands in the oil sands business. There's this side of the, you know, there's a side of the Aboriginal issue in Canada that, I mean, I've tried to look at, but I, I don't think it's got a lot of attention. Namely, um, sort of the conflicted position that, that First Nations are in. On the one hand, you're hearing arguments about moratoriums, no development. On the other hand, these industrial relations corporations that exist in First Nations community depend importantly on oil sands activities for their, for their livelihood. Um, Chief Adam, of the, who was beside Neil Young uh, in Toronto, um, called, the, uh, called the Alberta government racist uh, last year or the year before. I can't remember whether it was 2013 or 2012. Um, so you might think, well, he's calling them racist because the government is essentially responsible for poor life prospects at the, at the very best for First Nations people. He, that wasn't it at all. He called the government racist because they weren't supporting financially a native proposal, a native Indian proposal, to develop oil sands upgrader, an oil sands upgrader in Alberta. So this was a commercial proposal to develop, to exploit the oil sands that First Nations were behind, that the government didn't support. That's why they were racist. Not for the reasons that I think you would, that most of us would, would believe when we see Chief Adams sitting beside um, Neil Young. So it's, it, it, it's more complicated than, than, than I think some people um, realize. What, what about the economic issues? I think um, earlier you asked the question, is it economic? Yeah. And <coughs> considering uh, the, the inputs, I and mean, you earlier referred to that development, the development costs that were uh, how many times billions yep. more than initially predicted. And so that, I'm assuming, is much tax dollar public monies that were put into that kind of No. Or through tax breaks, royalty breaks, well, revenue. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, this is, um, to me, complicated. Maybe it'll be really easy for you to understand. But um, the way they set up the royalty system was, you only got charged a higher royalty on your production. And, and a royalty is essentially what the owner of the resource gets to let you have the right to develop. Okay. So they get a, percent, a percentage royalty the royalty only shifted to the higher rate once me, the company, had paid all of their development costs plus a rate of return. What this has suggested to some people is that you know, the overruns, in a sense, didn't cost companies anything, at least initially, because all they did is just they delayed the point at which they had to pay a higher royalty on their, on their, on their product. There's that aspect to it. That's where taxpayers arguably lost millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, was in, was in, 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 that, in that particular way. For companies, I think what's happened, and this is like sort of, again, I, you know, I, I grew up sort of thinking that you know, a right of center of government is gonna do things that's gonna be good for business. And they, we, want, we want business, we don't wanna we want, we want see them. Uh, go out of business. We, we, we depend on them. What's happened by the escalated cost is, whereas in the 1990s, the price of oil I don't think was important. It is important now. The, the cost of the projects has gone, has, has increased so dramatically. You had a, in 
one of Shell's projects, you had a cost escalation of over 300% in, in the project cost. It went from something like 3.9 billion to over 14 billion at the end of the day. So as the price of these projects has gone up, what I'm trying to say is that they need a higher price for oil in order to reach, in order to reach break even. And that's where the it's, it's really twisted. I mean, it's government in a sense by not doing anything the way I think anyways, has essentially you know, put a cloud over the development prospect, prospects of new projects because they need $90 oil in order to get their 14% internal rate of return. I don't know if that answers it or not. Well, I, I just was wondering if there are other costs that, you know, of course, aren't factored in oh. I mean, to, to this, the, no. the so-called uh, wealth generation, which, of course, when I was in Alberta, you know, rarely heard a critical word about the oil sands. Um, because people are convinced that the entire economy will fall apart, there will be no jobs in Alberta, the oil sands are not developed, etc. cetera. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, so, so I'm just assuming that there are other costs that people don't realize are not, uh, you know, that they will have to pay for in the long run. And certainly reclamation, reclamation is Reclamation is exactly. I mean, and I don't know if fund. there's a Canadian equivalent of the super, uh, fund? super fund. Yeah, but <coughs> yes and no. I mean, there is a, the companies are required to put aside a certain amount of money into a reclamation fund. But uh, I think I'm being honest and accurate when I say it's really a pittance in terms of what the costs of reclaiming lands are going to be. So this would be something, for example, that could come back on, 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 on taxpayers down the road. Um, things like um, transportation, uh, improving transportation links to Fort McMurray, that's something taxpayers would pay for. Um, with respect to hospital facilities, uh, dealing with the social dimension of oil sands operations. You know, like when your town grows by threefold, what changes do you have to make in sort of municipal infrastructure for that? That's something that those costs fall on, fall on, fall on taxpayers. So you certainly have seen those sorts of things. I think looking ahead, the big one for some people is concern about uh, reclamation and whether if a company goes bankrupt, what happens? You know, what, what, what happens if they, or if they decide to walk away from it? What happens under those, under those conditions? We might get a little more time to also to talk about um, global price in the context of energy export. Um, Desiree, in late March, what's the date for Wendy Olson and, and I? Um, but I think one thing to keep in mind is that, as you say, you know, you need ninety dollars a barrel. Um, you'll continue as long as we have ninety dollars a barrel, right? And then this is also an issue with the coal industry. That's so, off March twenty sixth. Yeah, and, and and I think it's 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 worth it to really kind of sort out some of the scenarios for energy prices uh, in the coming decades as a as, as, of course, people who make a lot more money than, than we do are doing right now. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, and of course, price is not just what the market will bear, price is what politics will impose. Um, so we could see, I, I don't know if, if you would agree, but some equations could change pretty dramatically um, with some political change. Now, whether that would be energy taxes or not or, or what, but essentially, if you need $90 a barrel, and, and markets, uh, the, 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 the politics in destination markets impose consumption taxes. That's going to come out of your 90s. So now you're going to need 110. Um, so I don't know if, if uh, there's a possibility of a crash. Yeah. That would say, that is to say, if there could be dramatic overinvestment over going on now, we just won't know it until it become, until the bubble bursts. Well, if you from, from history, I mean, what history tells me in Alberta, what will happen under that, under that circumstance is that companies will come to government asking for royalty holidays, for example, in order to keep, in order, in order to keep going. I have to say, though, what, you know, the, 
the, the drop in 2008 was, was significant. I mean, it was, uh, uh, you know, what did we, we went from about $140 a barrel down into the 30s. Short, and, short period of time. Yeah, for, okay. short, for a short period of time. But what is striking, I think, about the rough sense was the fact that it didn't really, I mean, projects were put on hold. Most of them have gone ahead again. You know, when, when I read things like Michael Clare writing about um, of demand in China and India and those sorts of places for petroleum, um, you know, that's where the future in terms of purchasing really, you know, really I think, probably exists. And, you know, Paul, the thing about this, though, is that I, I um, I guess I've been struck by just how long people have been constantly. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the same people who didn't think that oil would go to $140 a barrel, uh, they weren't saying that it was going to fall south of 100, let alone go where go it ended up. Um, you know, who in their right mind thought that the U.S. could be uh, a net energy exporter again on the petroleum side of things? I mean, you know, that, that's just nonsense. Yet that's what people want to talk about. So like 10 years has, has been, in, in, in my experience, it's just a huge time. There have been so many developments that have taken place. You know, what when the, when the cost of renewables comes, continues to come down as it has been falling, what is that going to mean for electricity generation? The, the, the big, the, the toughest, the, the toughest nut to crack, I think, on the, on the oil demand side of things is transportation. You know, that's, the, that's the big one. You know, but most of the oil that the U.S. imports goes into the transportation, goes into the transportation sector. And so you can, look at, you can look at substitution in other aspects of your energy economy, like electricity, for example, or heating. Um, but transportation is the one that if there's something revolutionary that happens there, then I wouldn't want to be I think maybe we've uh, imposed on you for quite a bit of extra time, so thank you. Uh, it would be great to talk longer, but um, uh, I want to make sure folks know that our second talk has been canceled. Um, and so maybe we'll thank you one more time and, and break here. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you.